Good evening, everyone. I think we're about ready to get started. If you don't know me yet, my name is Marianna Fisher, and I'm a sophomore here at NC State studying business administration. And tonight we'll be looking at several common misconceptions about Christians and Christianity, as well as how to address them. So I would start with the food vote. This is the part where Larry comes out and asks for the food vote. But this is actually our last meeting of this semester, and also the PowerPoint's not working apparently. There we go. I think it's just a loose connection, but bear with me please on that. If it's flickering in and out, it should come back apparently. But yeah, no food voting this time because it's the last meeting of the semester. We might actually have a couple of meetings at least um, during the Christmas break, if you're around for that, possibly during final week, I think. I don't want to speak too soon, but I think a party might be in the works. We're trying, we're trying to we're figure trying. something out for that, so stay tuned. Yes, trying to figure out that, some kind of gathering of some sort. Stay tuned, as Ms. Gulian, as Gulian said, and we will be ready for that. <coughs> so yes, then, have, hope you all have a good Christmas after this, if I don't get a chance to say that by the end. But yeah, so let's take a look at what we are doing tonight. So. I don't know how many of you might have talked about religion to people who follow other faiths, but you might have noticed that oftentimes you'll notice confusions come up about what we believe about their, what we understand about their beliefs, and what other people understand about our beliefs. And not always is it the person's fault, it's just that a lot of times it's like a game of telephone where you hear different things about beliefs and it kind of passes on and around and you end up not exactly knowing what people believe, even though you might think that you do. So it's always a good idea to ask questions about an individual, what they believe, since not everyone believes the same things. But hopefully most of us in this room all agree on some very core fundamentals about the Christian faith. So we'll be focusing on that tonight. In specific, we're going to look at 16 of the most common ones. A lot of these that we could have talked about would have been um, recaps from previous talks in the semester, so definitely keep those in mind and you can go back and look at those as well. Others of these are kind of combined, like large misconceptions, so 16 is about as concise as we can do it, but there will be an intermission at eight o'clock once we get to that point if you do have to leave, so don't worry about that. Um, yeah, for each misconception, we're gonna look at two things. The first will be where it likely came from, and then the second one, before I give suggestions of why it's wrong and how you might go about responding, I'll ask for all of you, please, to provide answers of how you might respond if you heard this in a conversation. But how might you generally respond to a misconception? Since we'll be looking at 16 in particular, it might be a good idea to think about a general one in case you hear one that hasn't come up or you don't remember exactly how to answer one. A really good way to do that is to follow the tactic strategy. Again, we're talking about Greg Kugel's book here. <laughs> You'll hear it over and over. We love this. What do you mean by that? How did you come to that conclusion? And have you ever considered? An example of one of the misconceptions we'll be talking tonight is a fairly common argument that atheists, or sorry, Christians only care about um, children who are unborn and don't care about what happens to them after they're born. You might say, what do you mean by Christians don't care about children after they're born? How did you come to that conclusion? And have you ever considered, for example, how many charities have been started by Christians to help children specifically? So yes, this strategy will pretty much always work. All right, and without further ado, we'd like to get into the first one here, which is the idea that love is the same as tolerance. However, um, tolerance may be defined to say that if you love someone, then um, you'll just accept anything that happens to you, you will put up with them, you can tolerate every offense that happens to you. Oh, you murdered my mom. It's fine. This seems to likely come from a misinterpretation of Matthew 5, 39 to 41. Uh, would anyone be willing to read the verse in blue, please? Got it. Sure. I tell you, don't resist an evildoer. On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on your right cheek, turn to the other, turn the other to him also. As for the one who wants you to wants to sue you and take away your shirt. Let him have your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Yeah, so you can see from this verse, Jesus' words, that it sounds like if someone is hurting you, then you need to let them hurt you more. We'll take a look and see soon whether that's true or not. But um, we've also got cult contributing to this misconception cultures, this general romanticism, progressivism, and twisting of the word love, even outside of religious contexts. So if someone 
was indicating in a conversation with you that they think love is the same as tolerance, Christians are just supposed to forgive everything, no questions asked. How do you think you would like to respond to that? I wish I would stop flipping too. <laughs> Sorry. Does anyone have any ideas? I do have the answer key. I'm ready to pull up, but. Sure. What do you mean by love? Kind of just said that. Really? Good answer, yes. <laughs> A lot of people might be defining love wrong, defining tolerance wrong, maybe equating the two definitions. Yeah, all right. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of these. Oh, sorry. Just one thing. Um, I don't know, like if I say I tolerate my wife, no one would take that to <laughs> um, Like, oh, they have a great relationship. Right? A lot of love in that relationship there. So they're obviously not the same word. Like, they don't mean the same thing, like, completely interchangeably. So there has to be some difference between that's very true, yes. Or not very true, it's kind of binary, true, false usually. But yes, very good way of putting it. I feel like a lot of times when this one comes up, people aren't directly saying, oh, love is the same as tolerance, or trying to really conflate the two, but what it kind of comes down to is this belief that they're about the same. All right, so here's some text. Hopefully you can read it, even though it's a little bit small. We've got a lot to point out on here. But um, you can take a look and point someone to <coughs> Jesus' command to be as innocent as doves and yet as cunning as snakes. So he is calling us to have sort of a childlike faith. He said you need to um, make yourself humble like a child to love the Lord well. But also he doesn't want us to just walk around like children who are trusting of everyone, just kind of accepting everything that comes to us. We also need to uh, defend ourselves and know what we're doing in that way. Um, this Matthew verse that's cited there where he says that, or sorry, the Matthew verse up above there is not speaking quite literally about being slapped around or having your shirt stolen. That's more of an insult. In um, ancient Israel, if someone was to slap you on the cheek, that was not meant to be like an actual assault on you. That was more of an insult. So yeah, if someone's actually assaulting you, you probably want to defend yourself. Um, Another point you could say is, why would Jesus tell his followers to let other people just completely ignore their boundaries, step all over them, if he went to the money changers' tables in the temple where they were misusing the house of God and completely overturned, overchanged them? That doesn't really sound like tolerance to me. That sounds a bit more like correcting someone in a loving way. Jesus has no sin, so he can correct us, but we are called to hate evil just in the sense that we aren't just judging someone, so to speak, by um, pointing out a sin that they're doing when we're doing the same sin but worse. Like Jesus said, take the plank out of your eye before you take the speck out of your brother's eye. That's what it is to be loving to others. We do have to guide them just because we don't want them to fall in the wrong way. It's kind of like when parents have to discipline their children. Forrest, I'm sure he's not here right now, but you have to babysit or discipline your son a fair Eventually. bit. Eventually. He, he might be young enough, but not yet. But one of these days, pretty soon, you're going to have to tell him, no, don't do this. It's for his safety. It's for his good so that he'll grow up to be a wise young man and will be able to love others well. So yes, Jesus says to love God and to love others. Loving yourself is not a commandment. It's really not in there. You just have to um, understand, even if you have to show someone a tough love that may be uncomfortable for both of you, that is what we are called as Christians to do carefully. Going to the second one here, um, the idea that Christians think that televangelists are good Christians. This seems to have come from a good anger towards scandalous televangelists like Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, who grossly misused viewers' donations, telling them they would go to an overseas ministry. Of course, it's giving me a look. I'm slightly concerned. Oh, right okay, cool. <laughs> who would, yeah, misuse funds, telling them they were going to overseas missions when, in fact, they were building a theme park in Charlotte, a Christian theme park, but still it's wrong to tell people that when that's not what it is. And um, Jim Baker also committed adultery and tried to cover it up. There's also Joel Osteen, who's of course the major proponent of the prosperity gospel, and Kenneth Copeland as well. So I think sometimes we'll run into atheists or just non-believers in general who think that televan recognize that televangelists are wrong, but think that we as other Christians agree with them. So how might you like to respond to this one? If you heard it come up. 
Or it's a good response to televangelists. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you think Christians think televangelists are good Christians. Uh, which Christians think that? Uh, the misconception is that Christians. No, I know. That's what I would okay. ask them. Uh, I, I would ask them which Christians think that. Like, have you actually met any that do, or is this just like a preconceived notion of yours? That's a good point. Yes, to ask and clarify who believes what. I would respond. Well, obviously, a lot of people they fill up our stadiums. Probably my response on the other side. I'm sorry, I think I misheard what you said. So I mean, I just just responding to Forrest, like I would say, well, clearly they have a lot of followers because they get lots of funding for their stadiums, right? So at least they call themselves Christians, right? Right, which alludes to a follow-up question I would have then. Right. Now we're just having a back and forth conversation. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> but things like, well, what do we mean by Christian? Like, what, what is definitional of a Christian? And do all these people following the stadiums actually reflect, you know, for example, the values of the first century, like uh, apostles and martyrs and all that? Um, and I would say probably not, but, but then there's more back and forth. Right. There's difference of belief where you have to draw the line between is this person actually a Christian and does he or she just claim to be a Christian while not actually living that out. So yeah, there is quite a following for televangelists, but are they, quote, just so to speak, good Christians? However you might like to define that. All right, go ahead and give you the answer key for this one, quote unquote, because there's always more answers that could be said. Obviously, y'all have been giving really good answers that aren't on the slide, but just some tips that I found through some research. Uh, unfortunately, yes, some of them really do just want your money, and a lot of Christians, hopefully most of us in this room, disagree with them, because many are preaching the prosperity gospel, or are just not preaching the right gospel in whatever way. But notice that us as Christians, we go to church, we give our friends Bibles, we have conversations with them about the Lord. I have never met a Christian who's told a friend to just go turn on the TV and go see what Jim and Tammy Day Baker are talking about today. That's not really how you do evangelism to friends, so why would it be the way that is preferred for doing evangelism to yourself or to others? Of, oh yeah, I don't go to church, I just turn on the TV in the morning might be a good way to help point out, yeah, we don't really take them seriously either. Coming up on this one, the idea that no Christian should ever have any kind of material wealth, that you should just give away all your possessions and be poor. This is what our uh, other chapter director, Julian, likes to call the poverty gospel. This seems to have come from Jesus' talk with the rich young ruler, as put, part of it put here in Matthew 19, 18 through 21. Would anyone be willing to read this verse, please? Can I go check? Sure. Uh, which commandments must I follow to have eternal life? He asked him. Jesus answered, Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. I have kept all these, the young man told him. What do I still lack? If you want to be perfect, Jesus told him, go. Sell your belongings and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Thank you. Yep, so this is a pretty well-known verse here. You might also consider um, the widow who gave the two coins that was all the money she had left, and Jesus applauded that. And also Paul's epistles talk a lot about giving away your possessions and sharing with others. So how might you respond to this one in conversation or anywhere? Sure. <coughs> In the Old Testament, we see people like David and Solomon, and God has given them a lot of wealth and riches, and he's blessed them with that. And so I don't think you can say that riches are necessarily <coughs> wrong in themselves when God's given it to people, like God's not doing the wrong thing there. So. That's true. Yeah, notice the... Go ahead, Mike. Okay. No, sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're no, good. Um, I was just going to point out um, a verse that often gets misquoted, that money is the root of all evil, to your point. Um, what the verse actually says, that's the version you usually hear, but if you actually read it, it says, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, which is a very clear distinction there. It's not money, it's the love of money. So yes, God gives us gifts like that. Okay, Mallory. Oh, I was just gonna say, like, you know, one of the 10 commandments is do not steal, and like, if you're not supposed to have material possessions, then why is stealing wrong? Hmm, that's a really good point. I guess because it's not nice to people, but then if that's where the conversation is going, you might have to argue about the moral law and all of that, depending on the conversation. Yes, sure. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> I think Forrest had his hand up, but then you. So, 
<clears throat> one more tactic from Greg Kukul's book is to never make a statement when a question will do. Uh. Right? And so my question for that would be, well, why did Jesus ask this specific person to sell all of his belongings? Right? Yes. Like, why, why specifically that? That's true as well. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that a bit later, but notice that this is a specific conversation with one person. It's not Jesus giving like a Sermon on the Mount or talking and arguing with a bunch of Pharisees. Okay, Julian. Um, for things like this, I kind of like to take them to their most absurd, just to show somebody that it doesn't really make sense. So if someone came up to me and was saying this, I'd probably ask them, would the material wealth you're railing against include clothing? Mm. If so, why are you wearing clothes? <laughs> like, yeah. That technically counts as material wealth, but we have no problem having clothes, at least bare minimum, you know, shirt and pants. So, uh, yeah, that's how I would respond. That makes sense. Yeah, you got to draw the line somewhere, right? And maybe you could argue all day about where to draw the line, but eventually you do have to draw that line. All right, there's no other ideas. We'll go over here, which, um, yeah, so as I think Forrest was hinting at, not everyone is called to this. It was a very specific conversation, and if you'll notice, um, this rich young ruler was kind of almost claiming to be perfect. Jesus listed about half of the Ten Commandments there, and the ruler told him, oh, I've kept all of these. In, I believe, Luke's account, he says, I've kept all of these from my youth. Kind of saying that he's never sinned, not actually saying that, but he's kind of making that claim that, oh, I'm really good, what else should I do? So, Jesus is... I don't know that we could say he's trying to be snarky or anything here, but he's definitely saying like, okay, then now you can go the extra mile and really give everything away. And if you remember the next few verses, it says, then the man went away sad for he had many possessions. So obviously this was a stumbling block for him, the love of money, love of possessions. He was a rich ruler, not just some guy who was kind of average and didn't have a lot of power. So you'll definitely want to note that because money is not a stumbling block for everyone. We all have different temptations that we struggle with. Um, yeah, we definitely should not covet. We should not be stealing from others. But um, yeah, we should give to the poor. But just enjoying the gifts that God has given us is not a sin. According to James 1, 17, I believe, or possibly 7, that every good and perfect gift is from the Father. So he wants us to enjoy what he's given us. Then um, we can see from Luke 12:48 that to whom much is given, much is required, which is to say that once you have a lot of gifts, you are supposed to share that with others. But again, finances are not necessarily a temptation that everyone should go through. Okay, then here going here, uh, Christianity is all about the rules. You might also hear this put as Christianity is just a bunch of rules. In other words, a couple of slightly different ways of saying this, homosexuality is a, saying that homosexuality is a sin is old fashioned. You might hear other sins mentioned this way as well, but this one seems to be a big one right now. Or to say that you'll go to heaven if you're a good person, if you do more good deeds than you do bad deeds. This likely came from seeing the book of Leviticus and understanding that we should serve God without actually taking the time to see just how much he loves us or not noticing that Jesus said he came to fulfill the law. He specifically said he did not come to destroy the law. <coughs> That's the verse there, Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Uh, would anyone be willing to read that one, please? Mallory. Don't assume that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy it, but to fulfill. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I kind of spoke on that one before you read it, but it's all right. Uh, this could also be from putting too much stock belief into Mosaic law, more on that in a minute regarding the law, but um, could also be the fear if you're new to church, new to Christianity, that you have been living a life of sin so far, so maybe you're not fit to come to church. Okay, so if someone was telling you that I'm a good person, I'll just go to heaven that way, how might you like to respond to that? Sarah. I would ask them, like, when are you good enough? Like, what makes you a good enough person? And then kind of, like, after that, go down, like, the idea of, like, we're never as good as God's standard of perfection is. We can't ever reach that, but start off with, like, what's good enough? Yeah. How do you determine that? 
Exactly. I mean, Jesus said, be perfect. That was one of the things he told us. Nobody's ever going to reach that. I think we've pretty much established that. So that's a really good question. Mally? You could also ask, how certain of you, how certain are you that you're going to heaven? That's a really good question. I feel like a lot of people just think they're going to kind of wing it, but that can produce a sense of fear for people. So. Obviously, we're not trying to coerce people to come to Christianity because they're afraid, but it's also a really good way to get people thinking. Yeah. Any more ideas? The side of the room is awfully quiet, so I'm slightly concerned about you guys. <laughs> but, <laughs> I mean, does, does, the, like, does the Bible, does Scripture actually say that you're saved by doing all these good things and like rule following? Or does scripture say that you're saved by some other means? Yeah, exactly. Right? And just like if, you know, because odds are like, this is someone who just doesn't understand Christianity at all. Right? Right. Um, and so, like, you know, ask them that. And if they answer, like, oh, well, it's by you know, rules, then ask, well, where, what makes you say that? Like, where do you see that being from in scripture? <coughs> and then, they, you know, they won't just find it. Just find it. Um, and so, you know, kind of leading them, like, lead them gently down the path to realize, okay, this is just something I kind of pulled out of here. Yeah, that's very true. I think psychologically people are just kind of predisposed to notice things that we don't like. So people are very quick and easy to notice there's a lot of rules in the Bible. But sometimes we can overlook all the good things that are there as well. All right, so um, you'll notice that Jesus specified several laws that he set us free from. He said at one point that, or the gospel says at one point that he made all foods clean. Also, um, he told us that we don't have to avoid all work whatsoever on the Sabbath anymore by doing a lot of healings on the Sabbath. Many times he did that, and the religious leaders of the day got very upset with him for that. So those laws are specifically ceremonial. They're laws that God prescribed to help the Israelites be set apart from all other peoples of the world, for God to say, you are mine, you are different. But there are also a lot of moral laws. And Jesus didn't say we don't have to follow any laws anymore. For example, he never said don't follow the Ten Commandments anymore. He never told us to disregard that. Those are moral laws which help make us more like God. Not in the sense that we become God or anything, just that we become more perfect. So, um, yeah, we don't always have to follow the ceremonial laws anymore. But there are a lot of moral laws, so to say that any law is old-fashioned is kind of silly. Like, are we going to say, oh, murder is also old-fashioned? People did that back then, they still do it now. How is that any different from homosexuality? How's, or acting in homosexually specifically, not just the temptation of it. Or how is that any different from lying? Lying, we've done that forever. Is not lying an old-fashioned idea now all of a sudden? Yeah, and looking specifically at the act of homosexuality, it's still condemned in the epistles. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, Paul lists several different sins that Christians are specifically not supposed to commit because we're supposed to be in the world, definitely not of the world, and that's listed in there with several others. Just because something is old doesn't mean it's bad, kind of getting back into that point. It's the gospel, Christianity, is also very much about um, free forgiveness, in other words, you didn't do anything to earn it, and love, even though you broke all of the rules, all of the standards of perfection. And if you ever want to take an even closer look at this, you can see Luke 18, 9-14, where Jesus tells the parable of a tax collector and a Pharisee, a religious leader of the day, who go to pray, and the tax collector's prayer is very humble, but whereas the Pharisees is more loud and proud, and you know Pharisees are obeying all the laws, the tax collector has betrayed his own people, the Israelites, but God says his prayer, Jesus specifically, his prayer is better. So obviously it's not just about the rules and what you have done. In fact, it's more about what you've not done, what God has done. <laughs> okay, next is the idea that after becoming Christian, you can do anything you want. Christianity, believing in God, is a free license to do what you want to do. This likely came from overextending the meaning of Romans 8.1. Would anyone like to read that one, please? Of course. <coughs> <We're good. laughs> There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thank you. 
Sorry, you'll get the next one. How's that? <laughs> sure, that's fine. All right. So it's obviously a very happy verse. It's one of my favorite verses. But we have to put it in context, as we'll see in a moment. There are also lots of similar verses that tell us about how we've been set free and um, you know how much God loves us and all of that. But does that mean that we can do whatever we want? How might you respond to that? I see some shaking heads, which is good, so we understand that this is incorrect, but can we explain why? Mallory. James says that faith without works is dead. So if you are not living like you have been transformed by Christ, then it might be an indication of where your heart's at. That's not to say that they're not saved, but we're not. Paul had some very strong words in one of the epistles for, for the church that was just doing whatever they wanted to um, because they thought they were free in Christ. But That's freedom. freedom in Christ doesn't mean you're like going and shackling yourself to more sin. Right. It's like how you do sin. I don't know. That was not at all a question. <laughs> no, you're good. Yeah, because as you're kind of saying, it's we're free from sin, but that doesn't mean we're free to commit sin. <laughs> exactly. Really. Several times in the Gospels, Jesus heals somebody and then says, go and sin no more. Mm. Yes. So he wants people to believe in him and have that faith but then he also wants them to go and live righteous lives. It's just that the, the righteous life comes after the faith. And it, he didn't say okay, go and do whatever you want and when you get hurt again, I'll heal you again. It's like, no, go and sin no more. So yeah. if he said it, it's good enough for me. That's a really good point. Thank you. Yeah, I think I saw another hand, so I'll come to you next. I was going to say pretty much the same thing as him, but it's like about setting the example when we're saved we're not told to go be not worry about sinning or just do whatever we want. I mean, he tells us multiple times um, just to, you know, go out there and sin no more and set an example to also bring people to him. You know, we're told to spread the gospel in many ways. So, I mean, that's one way by setting a good example for other people. Exactly. Yes. That's part of what we have to do. Go ahead. Um, I don't know if I'm like misremembering this, but I think like in literally the next chapter, or maybe it's chapter 12, but like the first verse, he answers that exact question. He's like, so now should we go keep sinning so that grace may abound? By no means. <laughs> or so, you know, and then he explains why. Yeah, I really like that point about so that grace may abound. Like it's not that we're trying to get more and more grace, get all the grace out of life that we can. <laughs> it really is about um, kind of the opposite end of the spectrum from the last one. It's not just about rules, and it's not just about being free from the rules to do whatever you want in that sense. Thank you. All right, so yeah, um, some of these answers include that when Jesus was talking to a Pharisee in the book of Matthew, he simplified the Ten Commandments down to two. He said to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself, being anyone else. He just did not say that there are now zero commandments that we have to follow. We just narrowed it down a little from what was already there and simplified it. We still have to obey God if we love him. That's how we prove that we do. I forgot who it was who cited another verse, verse about that, but um, I found 1 John 5, 3 that tells us that as well. Um, yeah, we're not supposed to sin anymore. Again, coming back to Jesus telling us to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, which obviously none of us can do, unfortunately. So that's is why we need Jesus. That's why we still have to have a relationship with him after we become Christian, because sadly we are still going to keep sinning. But that doesn't mean that we're trying to sin, exactly. We know it's right, and therefore we need to do what's right. Okay, next is the idea that if you are a true Christian, then nothing bad will ever happen to you, and if something bad happens to you, that means you must have sinned. This is known as the prosperity gospel. Uh, likely came from recent preachers and televangelists like Joel Osteen. I don't know if it's been around longer than that. It probably has, but it's especially blown up in recent years from people like him, who say that if you have troubles, again, you've disobeyed God, you've lost favor with him, or if you have a lot of really good things in life, that must mean that you're really obedient to, the, to God and that you really love him. So how might you like to respond to this one? If someone's telling you, well, you're really dirt poor, then you must not be a Christian. I would ask them kind of what happened to Jesus and his disciples, like the original 12, because almost all the 12 ended up being like Jews for their beliefs, so they were definitely Christians and followers of Jesus. Yeah, and yet bad things still happen to them. 
not just that, but like the life of Paul, right? Like his entire <laughs> life was just like hardship and poverty and literally getting stoned to death and rose and risen back and then going back in to preach to them again. It's just like yeah. He just had a lot of endurance. Yeah, and that is one of the things that uh, Jesus said, or Paul said, speaking for Jesus, you know, through the Holy Spirit, that uh, hard times produce endurance, which produce character, which produce hope. So yes, bad things happened to Paul. He sure knew of hard times, and yet he still had hope in the Lord. Julian. And Jesus himself said that we'd be persecuted for our faith. Yep. So I don't know why anyone, like, Joel and King, for example, would say that they know better than Jesus does. Yeah, that's a pretty bold claim to be making. Yeah. <laughs> Any other ideas? I saw in the Bible it says that in this world we'll have trouble, but um, take heart because God has overcome. So it's not always the trouble is not always coming from like disobedient from God, like disobedient God. But in this world, this is a simple, like a lot of, because Adam and Eve, what, had, what, what they have done, so it's a lot of consequences. And yeah, it's definitely a fallen world, and God's not the one causing the evil, he is allowing it to happen. But Christians, non-Christians alike have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. yes. Valerie. I might also add that Christians still can suffer consequences for wrong things that they have done, and that is technically a bad thing, but directly if you murder somebody, you're going to go to jail. And like, you might consider jail a bad thing, but you did something to deserve that. So like, God can still allow consequences to happen, but it doesn't mean that you're like sinning to cause it. Mm, that makes sense. So like, that's partly true. <laughs> yeah. So I guess what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is that sometimes bad things do happen to you because you sinned, but you can't say that if you're a Christian, nothing bad will ever happen, or because something bad happened, you definitely sinned. That makes sense, yes, and I think that's a good thing to point out as well. Okay, so to look at the quote-unquote answer key for that one, um, yeah, Jesus said, as most of you, several of you have pointed out, that Jesus said precisely otherwise. I think John 16, 33 is the one that you just cited, that um, he's overcome the world, and he was spe speaking specifically to his apostles, so obviously to people who are Christians, not just to the general public. Uh, Matthew 10, 22 and Matthew 24, 9 say very similar things. And then in Luke 13, 4, people were asking Jesus about a tower that had recently fallen and killed a bunch of people and asking him, did those people sin more than the people in Jerusalem have been sinning? And Jesus said, no, they really haven't. Bad things just happen to, you could say to good people, or at least nobody's really good, but to people who haven't sinned recently and before asking for forgiveness and actually repenting. Yes, so even though bad things are happening, we still have an eternal delight, joy in the Lord through the Holy Spirit. And I think it might be good to <coughs> differentiate between happiness and joy, where happiness is just a temporary mood when your circumstances are good, but what God really wants us to have is joy in Him, always, because He is good. So you might not always feel happy when you have joy, but it's kind of like peace as well, and just delight in the Lord. Next one is that uh, either God's, God is the one sending people to hell, or some people might go even further and say that he enjoys sending people to hell. Another way of saying this that's essentially the underlying claim that you might like to argue against here is this idea that people are not inherently evil, that people are inherently good or neutral. This seems to have come from reading the Old Testament just too fast and not reading the New Testament enough, or maybe reading it too fast and not really taking it in. So if you've ever heard someone say that God enjoys sending people to hell or that people are not inherently evil, how would you respond to that? Go ahead. Which God are you? Yes. I really like that answer, because <laughs> when people say that, my tendency is to say, yeah, I don't want to believe in a God like that either. <coughs> of course. Did you know that the, uh, the kind of people who commit genocide, um, according to genocide researchers, are the average member of any given population? The average member? Mm-hmm. Okay. So like, the whole people are inherently evil. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how you square that with the fact that you know you have people that are school teachers and policemen, firefighters, all that kind of stuff. 
they are the kind of people who commit genocide all across the world, cross-culturally. Um, that seems to be a pretty good counterexample to that. Yeah. That's a pretty good one. Or just you see people doing bad things every day. Everybody does something bad almost every day. So, I mean, some people might have a different definition of good and evil, which may not be the right standard. But it's still pretty hard to argue. You have to really back up that argument that people are not inherently evil, which some people might not have thought about enough, and you might be able to guide them with questions to really think about it. OK, so let's go ahead and take a look at these, I suppose. Uh, one thing you can do is to note Genesis 1 through Revelation 22. <laughs> That's a pretty slam dunk answer. Uh, I really like, Joe came up with this phrase, and I really like that. Um, you can also point out to people that people are going to hell by their own choice if they don't want to accept God's love and law for us. If God told us we have to love him and we have to spend all of our lives after we've died with him, we're not really going to want that. That's not actual love from either of us, and it just it's not a good circumstance to be in. Um, yeah, again, I don't want to believe in a God like that either, like you were saying. And then, yeah, also note that God loves us so much that he's not going to force us to believe in him or to accept him. That's part of how much he loves us, that he doesn't force anyone into heaven against their will. Um, yeah, he's holy and he is loving. And you have to have both of those at the same time. Holy enough that he can't let anyone who is imperfect into his presence or his power will just kill them. That's why Moses couldn't actually see God's face in the Old Testament. But at the, at the same time, he's loving, and that's why he sent Jesus to give us the option to be redeemed if that's what we would choose. Okay, next is the misconception that Christianity is just copies of older religions. This likely came from people noticing the similarities between Christianity and older religions and taking a bit of a leap of logic there. So, responses for this one. I mean, I think it would matter how much, like, for you to ask the person that's making that assumption. I mean, check check them in the way that what do they know? Like, ask them what they know already to see what they're basing that off of. If they don't know anything that much about Christianity, then I mean, obviously, it's there for you to inform them because they're just un they're uninformed. But I mean, if they know a lot and they're making that assumption, then ask them the specific reasons and then give them examples or answers. That's a good point, yeah, because I think a lot of people, when they make this argument, are just kind of saying it because they've heard other people say it, but they can't always point to specific religions or specific things that have supposedly been copied. So yes. I'd ask, what religion specifically? Give me, yeah. give me an example, and we'll talk about it. Exactly. Yeah, offering to talk things through with people is good as well. Also, just to clarify, like, what is the starting point that they're calling Christianity? You know, so that you can decide what's older than that. Because if their starting point is like Christ, or you know, going back to like some kind of just figuring out what they're comparing it to. Okay, so like, ask them whether they see um, copy, supposed copies of the Old Testament more or the New Testament. Or kind of <coughs> well, like, to say that it's being copied from older religions, like, where are you? We're starting out from Christianity and then like that older would be, you know. I think I might understand what you're saying. Like what does older mean? Yeah, like right. if you okay. don't know what you're comparing the older to, then like it's hard to define that. So I think that makes sense. Yeah, like religions maybe that came about before yeah. Jesus died and resurrected or versus before his birth, versus before I don't know. Isaiah at the time of the prophets. Right. So what's the starting point that they're talking about? That makes sense. Yeah. Austin, then Mallory. I saw you first. I'd also like to ask why it matters. I mean, just because some things are similar to it doesn't make Christianity wrong. Other things are similar in some ways or not in other ways. So it's like, you know, it can be <coughs> scientific because you have an older iteration doesn't make the new iteration wrong. Right? That's true. I mean, if you want to argue that, then you would say Christianity just copied from Judaism because we pretty much have the same Old Testament as their books. So, yeah. 
night. Yeah, along the same lines, like we do see similar accounts of like the Genesis narrative throughout history, and that I think that goes to support the idea that it actually happened. And so then, which account are you going to take to be true? Obviously, there's a lot of reasons to believe the Bible. So, yeah, that out too. That's also true. I will point out real quick that um, this is just some interesting trivia that most cultures around the world do have a story that's a lot like Noah that tells of a worldwide flood. So there's some good evidence. Uh, I think I saw Forrest next, and then you, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but you're next. Yeah, I was going to say, just because there's, basically, what Austin said, um, just because there's similarities, how do you know from there that it was therefore copied? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, you'd have to make a case for that. Yes. Um, Again, belief of logic. Yeah, yeah because like, a lot of times when people say this, it's religions that are like all the way around the world from each other. Right? right. You have like things that Aztecs were believing or something. It's like, oh yeah, well, they, you know, the Jews in first century copied it from this other religion thousands of miles away. It's like, well, how? <laughs> yeah, it's not <laughs> like know? nowadays where you got the internet yeah, or like, where airplanes. The, the encounter, you know, and <laughs> That's a good point as well, yeah. Okay. Um, my name is Jin Jin, I think of So that's easy to remember. Uh, well, I would say that I would agree with them first that they are similarities between Christianity and other religion, maybe some uh, like some part of it. Sure. But I would also ask them and challenging them like, what is the basic like, what is the fundamental that differences between like Christianity and other religion? Like no other God, no other whoever called God or whatever in other religion would say that Jesus died on the cross and died for you and me and also it's like it's 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 about faith like it's about grace. Um, faith through grace and there's no other religion is like that and everybody like a lot of people who say that oh it's similar to like Buddhism or oh, it's all about like doing good things and good deeds and but those are not those are not the fundamental um, thing that Christianity is not calling us to do good it's not do but it has been done exactly <laughs> and so it's like it's been done and then we have the faith and then we will do the produce the good work that God already prepared us to do to do like Ephesians 2 says yeah so I would challenge them to think about the differences the main differences between Christianity and other religions that's a very good point yes some of you most of you actually have probably seen the coexist bumper stickers and everything like oh yeah all the religions are basically the same <laughs> You might have also seen lately um, contradict bumper stickers pointing out they can't all be true. <laughs> They've all got lots of differences as well. So focusing on the differences could really help. Did you have your hand up? Yeah, I was just going to say, like, I don't know what these other uh, religions are or myths are, but like you mentioned, like the flood, and I think I've heard like it's conceivable that depending on how you view these stories and how they should be interpreted, that. Uh, these stories could have superficial similarities on purpose as a way of expressing a truth that was understood by the population of people at that time because of their familiarity with the, these other religions. Yeah, that's actually really getting on a point that uh, Julian had been telling me about with polemics of sometimes religions are just like pointing out similarities between other religions on purpose to say here's why they're wrong and here's why we're right. So yeah, very astute. All right, go ahead and go here just for the sake of time because we're getting pretty close to eight. But um, yeah, so many of these religions didn't really gain traction until after Jesus resurrected. So there's going into the time element for you, which means that most likely just because of how things like this work, uh, they likely changed from their original forms and therefore copied from Christianity. Uh, yeah, again, similarities are not equal to copies. And uh, that last point that Davis mentioned as well. And it, but yeah, so I think we pretty much covered everything there. Going to the next one, uh, the idea that there's no actual evidence for Christianity whatsoever. Welcome to Rossio Christi, guys. We do this every Monday night. <laughs> In other words, you could be stating that Christianity is just a fairy tale and some of us know it, but we really like deluding ourselves. And others of us are just weirdly convinced by this thing that has no evidence. Likely came from Christians trying to provide evidence, but unfortunately it was not good. For example, some Christians will try to offer as evidence, oh, I pray to God. That's not actually evidence, it's not proving or disproving the existence of God, it's just a statement about what you do. It could also come from Jesus talking so much about faith, 
uh, some people just not feeling God's presence in their lives, even if they think that they've heard the right gospel, they could have heard a false one, so their idea of God is a bit skewed. Or it could come from not knowing or understanding the evidence that you have seen. So for this one, how would you like to plead? Hmm. You'll come back. I don't know why it's doing that, so I'm really sorry about that. It seems to be a loose connection, and I just unplugged it entirely. Good job, me. I've been taking all of these, but Sorry, Sarah. Here we go. I think I would just ask them what evidence they've looked at because some people say this but they never actually looked into any of the evidence and never like asked any questions or like read anything about it and they'll just make the claim there isn't evidence before they look into it. So I think just asking like well, what have you looked at and do you know, they actually have looked into it before or just saying making the statement that there's no evidence. Yeah. And then of course from there you can point out like here's maybe why it's good evidence, here's why it's maybe not good evidence that someone has been offered, but here's better evidence or what part of the evidence are you confused by? Yes. I feel like part of it is just like the assumption that uh, like the new has like science has replaced um, like Christianity as an explanation like like for example the Big Bang like that all these things are uh, like replacing and mutually exclusive or they somehow disprove Christianity. Yeah, that could be as without, well. Without like examining too closely whether they do. Of I'm not sure if this is going to be one of your other misconceptions, but this seems uh, eerily similar to the whole um, faith is the opposite of evidence view, mm. where it's like, you know, faith is believing without evidence. Yeah. Um, so arguing Which isn't true. Right. right. <laughs> I guess that's not what Christians mean when they say faith, but... Yeah. Um, so arguing more for a blind faith, in other words? Yeah, or... Um, Saying faith is irrationality. Mm. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, this, this just reminded me of that. Uh, that makes sense. Misconception. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I think you were on to it, like trying to discern what where the confusion is, because some people are, you know, they, they say, oh, it's not historical. That's different than somebody who says, I don't believe there's a God, you know, uh, or Jesus didn't fulfill the Jewish prophecies, like there's all these different arguments of trying to just discern, like, what do you mean there's no actual evidence for Christianity in one way, and then going from there. That's a really good point as well, because there's scientific evidence, there's historical evidence, there's philosophical evidence, logical evidence, so maybe taking a look and seeing what type of evidence has this person heard versus not heard, and what are they maybe getting hung up on. Oh, I guess also one quick last thing, um, to ask, like, what do you count as evidence? Okay. What do you consider to be evidence? Right? Because if they're looking for like, you know, uh, scientific evidence for a metaphysical uh, or like physical evidence for a metaphysical thing, then like they're just committing a category mistake. Right? Good luck, yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it'd be like asking for like historical evidence for like a scientific thing. It's like, well, like there's different categories of evidence and like you just can't cross boundaries like that. Also a very good point. Yeah. Alright, let's go ahead and hit some answers for these. Um, yeah, pointing to some of the evidence that you've learned here, if you've been coming to Russia Christie frequently, would be a good idea. For example, the Kalam cosmological argument, which Forrest loves talking about. Um, this one is basically saying that, correct me if I get it wrong, but I think it's basically that everything that exists has a cause, the, everything that comes, yeah, everything that exists comes, has a cause, universe exists, therefore the universe has a cause, and then you can deduce from there that that cause is God, since it has to be outside of the universe. Uh, you can also look at the fine-tuning argument, which points out just how specific um, the Earth is, like its distance from the sun, or the exact tilt of the Earth, all these different astronomical, not astrological, astronomical things and scientific aspects there are to the world, the universe, the solar system, the earth, that make life the way it is, that looks pretty clearly like there was a design. You can also take a look at 1 Peter 3.15, which is kind of about the blind faith thing, or that faith has no evidence, that says to always be ready to give a defense or answer for the faith that you have. So clearly Peter knew that there must be evidence out there in order for that to work. Um, 
you can also look at the way Dr. Frank Turk and Dr. Norm Geisler put it, who wrote, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. As they say, it takes more faith to be an atheist because there's less evidence for that. Faith brings us to Jesus into heaven, but we also need some evidence so we're not just wishy-washy. We don't want to be like the seeds that fell amongst the weeds that received the gospel with joy, but as soon as troubles came, they had no root and just fell away because they didn't really see any evidence for the word, didn't know what to do with it after that. Also note that God created reason and logic, so don't you think he would want to use reason and logic for the most important thing that anyone could ever think about? There you go. Some people might try to point out like, oh, Jesus never tried to provide evidence for himself except for the apostles. For example, how Tom, uh, Jesus told Thomas when he was doubting the resurrection, like, feel my hand, feel my side, see I've resurrected. But yes, you might argue that Jesus didn't specifically say anything to people now, like, oh, people 2,000 years from now, you'll understand this. Here's some evidence right here. <coughs> Because that was a little unrealistic, but if you look at all of the other evidence there is out there, it's just an abundance of it, and there really is enough. Okay, and it is just about 8 o'clock, so if anyone would like to leave, feel free to go ahead, and we'll try to get through the rest of these for everyone who'd like to stay. First, go ahead. Part of the intermission, right? Inter yes, the intermission is what we'd like to call this now. <laughs> so for that? Get more food, get more drinks, use the restroom. Be back in five minutes. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah, I forgot yeah. that we're doing like an actual intermission. Yeah, an actual so. intermission. So let's do that. Anyone that wants Take to quietly away. disappear during that intermission. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, very cleverly. Not <laughs> that you cannot have prayer and medicine. Which seems to come from the fact that God is supernatural and cannot be directly observed through science, plus a misunderstanding of how God answers prayers. Like Jesus says, if you pray to this mountain to move and it will move, thus can we have prayer and medicine? If you're a true Christian, you'll just pray and you will be healed, right? Directly healed by God, miracle. How might you answer that one? Virtually. <laughs> um, we already talked about how you're not guaranteed to just have a perfect life where nothing bad happens to you. Right. So that doesn't mean that every time you pray for something bad to go away, it's just going to go away like that. Like Bad things, suffering, are used for our benefit, even if it doesn't seem like it. Yeah. Um, so there's that. Exactly. Like Paul talks about, I forget which book it is, but he writes about um, a painful thorn in his side, which may or may not have been literal, that he'd been praying over and over for it to go away, and God has not <coughs> taken it away at that point. So there's definitely that. Of course. Uh, I'm going to tell a short story. Okay. Um, so there's a man in his house, and there's a you know a big hurricane coming, with a, and it's going to flood. So like, the hurricane comes, and uh, they tell him to evacuate. And he's like, no, it's okay, God will protect me. And so the hurricane comes and the floods start, the you know, waters start to rise. And so he goes up to the second store, you know, floor of his house. He's looking out the window and a boat comes by and says, hey, you know, we're, we're here to rescue you, get on the boat. And he said, no, it's fine, you know, God, God will protect me. And then flood waters continue to rise and he finds himself on his roof, right? And now a helicopter comes over his head. And you know, so, you know, they let down the ladder and he's like, hey, you know, get in. Um, because like, you know, we're the last boat there to get out of here. He's like, no, it's fine, God will, God will provide. Um, and then, so the guy drowns, and he's in heaven, he stands before God, he's like, you know, God, you know, I, had all, I had all this faith, like, I was praying to you the whole time, why didn't you, like, like, do anything? And God's like, I sent you a boat and a helicopter, right? Like, sometimes God's answer to prayer isn't uh, through natural means, it's not always a supernatural answer. Exactly. 
story to reflect on. <laughs> which is pretty much what you're saying God works through doctors <coughs> and medicine. Or in other examples, he just works through other people to help provide for us. Notice in the Bible just how many times God is working through another person to do something. You can look at Gideon, you can look at Deborah, pretty much all of the judges. You can look at King David, you can look at the Israelites sent to kill the Canaanites. Basically, everyone mentioned in the Bible is someone that God is working through. All of the um, people who trusted God, of course, not like people who didn't but um, rarely does he just come down from heaven on a cloud and says okay now I'm gonna take care of you don't worry about anything and he literally comes and fixes everything I don't know that we've actually seen God do that before aside from Jesus coming down and he did not descend like a king he came down as a little baby and lived on earth like we did so yeah God is working through people he is doing that, but it's not that prayer and medicine are incompatible. You can pray for medicine and God will give it to you in specific ways. Okay, next one being that uh, Christians, mentioned this one briefly, are taught to only care about the unborn and that we're taught not to care what happens to children after they're born. For some reason this is a very popular argument right now. And it likely came from conservative Christians just understanding basic economics and familial structures and therefore not supporting government-provided, in particular, care. Also, sadly, some people who call themselves Christians really don't care about children, which, of course, is not what we're called to do, but some people are like that. How might you respond to this one? Julia. If I could actually add a little bit of context to the misconception, it comes up a lot when people are talking about abortion. Yes. Uh, it's like a rebuttal to people who say that abortion is wrong. People will say, well, you know, you seem to only care about babies while they're in the womb, but after you don't care about them at all. And that's a bad argument, but I think that's a separate discussion. Um, but that's usually where I've heard it, at least. Exactly. Yeah, I probably should have made that clear. This is definitely an abortion um, conversation. But this one I did not know at all how to answer it until I was looking it up for this presentation. So. Yeah, this one's kind of a hard one. First, were you about to raise your hand? No? Okay. I mean, I can talk to you a lot, but... I'm going to do it. Whatever you want. I guess we can go ahead and take a look at this one. Oh, so you see it. Yeah, so you can definitely note the uncountable stories of Christians caring about children, starting charities, such as uh, Child Fund International, where you can sponsor a child overseas, help them go to school, or uh, Operation Christmas Child, another famous one, where you uh, mail a Christmas gift to children overseas. So yeah, we definitely care about children. Lots of people donate to these charities who are Christian. They were, these particular ones were started by Christians. Lots of hospitals, for example, have been started by Christians. So that claim is just basically you know, evidence for it <laughs> when you look at the really big picture. Uh, James 127 tells us to look after widows and orphans who were very um, vulnerable in ancient Israel especially, that can really be expanded to caring for all children. Jesus loved the little children, wanted them to come to him, so definitely that as well. We're supposed to care for children in the same way that he did. And then Luke 17 too tells us what the punishment for mistreating or misleading children is, which is to tie a stone around your neck and go drown yourself. So obviously Jesus had some words about this as well. <laughs> He cares about all children and all people. Going to the next one, the idea that Jesus is a socialist. You'll actually most of the time hear this as Jesus was a socialist, but I figured let's narrow this down to one misconception. <laughs> yes, Jesus is alive. <laughs> this seems to have come from overextending the commands by uh, Jesus and various New Testament authors to give to the poor, to share with others. So it's kind of related to the um, poverty gospel, but still kind of a different subject, more specifically about the character of Jesus. Thoughts on this one? Go ahead. I uh, just uh, questioned that, like, uh, have you looked into the context? Like, is, was Jesus' words about the government or about the individual? Exactly. Yes. Jesus didn't give a whole lot of commands specifically to government. He did say, you know, we do need to pay our taxes, that everyone in authority was put in authority by the Lord. 
that sort of thing, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But he didn't give a lot of direct commands to government institutions. Correct. Any more? Good. I would ask what they mean when they say socialist, because mm -hmm. there's lots of people who will say varying definitions for socialism. And then when they're thinking about Jesus, they're probably thinking about like a certain thing that he did or said. So I'd ask him, okay, so how does that fit into what you say socialism is? And it's probably not going to fit. Yeah, that very well could be as well. Like some people define socialism kind of more loosely. Some people essentially equate it with communism. You might want to figure that out. Yeah. All right, so to take a look at this one here. Um, so by the way, I'm a business major. I think I mentioned that at the beginning, that I'm majoring in business administration, concentration in marketing. So I'm in school with the accounting majors, the economics majors. I'm taking accounting and economics classes in addition to marketing and all these other things. So I can, at the end of the day, tell you, please, no. <laughs> Jesus was not a socialist. He's not advocating for that. Because where in the Bible did he say, as you pointed out, to share everything you own with everyone else in an equal distribution of wealth that is mandated by and controlled by the government. Crickets. Yeah. Um, socialism could maybe work if humans were perfect. Yeah, if people were perfect, then we could all share our wealth with one another, we could all be well off, we would all still be working, but we live in a fallen world. And so from every example that we have seen where socialism is practiced, it does make everyone worse off. People don't want to be productive and work if they're just getting everything anyway. The way my uh, accounting tech, sorry, economics textbook put it is picture all of the resources an economy has as like a pie, and every time the government tries to cut the pie into slices that are more equally sized, in other words, to give everyone a more equal distribution of wealth, the pie shrinks. So it's obviously a very weird metaphysical pie that could not exist in the real world, but it is a good illustration of what ends up happening in practice. Because sharing and giving to the poor and all of that is a free kind choice. God isn't coming and grabbing your hand and making you give to this specific person over here. An illustration you might like to use is that when, which kind of kindergarten teacher would you like? One who sees Johnny and Ben, Johnny has a toy, Ben does not, and she grabs the toy from Johnny and gives it to Ben so that he now has a toy also, or who lightly prods Johnny, hey, did you see that Ben doesn't have a toy? Maybe you want to share it with him. I think we like the second teacher a little bit more. It's a little bit nicer and it kind of makes everyone happy at the end of the day. So yes, equality and equity are not the same. Now I gave a really good explanation as to why last year, so you could take a look at that in our presentation records. And you might finally know as a nice um, mic drop that Karl Marx hated Christianity, so he would never agree with the idea that Jesus is a socialist, and if you told him that, he would hate you too. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. If, just, hello? hello. Sorry. <laughs> I'd also like to add, um, there are examples where Jesus would, it, would give an example to Jesus? Paul. Paul, sorry. Paul. Sure. Uh, where for the same group, depending on the subgroup within that group, how distribution should be given to any, either of them, for example, widows. So if you're a young widow, you have different resources than if you're an older widow, things like that. Okay, I forgot about that part. I can't think of it right now, but believe me. <laughs> <laughs> don't you don't have to, you can look it up. <laughs> yep, <laughs> don't just take our words for anything. So this one, yes, the text is off to the side for a reason, but um, the idea that Christians are bad at being Christian and therefore you should not be a Christian. This likely came from Christians failing at practicing what we preach because, <coughs> yes, unfortunately, again, we are not sinless even once we're Christian, plus the illogical generalization of this. How do you plead? So, I'm sorry. <laughs> I would ask them um, if Christians being bad Christians affects at all, like, any truth about Jesus and what he taught and, like, the resurrection or any of the historical facts about Christianity and Jesus. Yes, that's true. Okay, so double the good point, Julian. I'd say that's the point. That's the <laughs> like point. We're all bad. Yeah. And I think Frank Turek said it, but he's like, um, if people call Christians hypocrites, it's like, 
Come on down to church. We got room for one more. <laughs> We're all hypocrites. Like we understand that at the jump, we're not trying to be, or we can't be perfect. So we're not saying that we're better than anybody else for that reason. Exactly. If we were perfect and good at being Christian, then why would we need Jesus? Yep. So yeah, we are supposed to imitate Christ <laughs> and not imitate each other. <laughs> Yeah, we're still human. Again, we, bless you, we are not, once we become Christians, we're not turning into God, we're just trying to be more like God with the Holy Spirit living in us. Uh, to rephrase the quote, another thing that uh, Dr. Turek says, if you saw a performance of Hamlet where, hello, go no, ahead. No, no, finish. Okay, sure. If you saw a production of Hamlet where all the actors are constantly forgetting their lines, they're just kind of mumbling to each other, the lighting is not good, keeps flickering. Would you say that Shakespeare is a bad playwright, that Hamlet is just an awful play and it's his fault, or would you blame the cast and crew of this particular production? Cast and crew. Cast and crew, thank you. I, I hope so. I mean, unless you just don't like Hamlet and don't like Shakespeare, which is fair enough, but the argument here is about this performance in particular, not about the creator. Julie, do you have a point? I was going to say, kind of going off of that, that's also just a mindset that you don't keep for literally anything else in life. Mm -hmm. There's no other time for if you're bad at something, they say you just shouldn't do it. Yeah. Usually it's like, oh, we'll get better. Yeah, there so. you go. It's pretty mean to tell someone, oh, you're bad at guitar, you should just stop playing guitar. Don't, yeah. don't practice, just stop. I mean, atheists are really bad at being atheists. They're always looking for meetings and stuff, so. Or they shouldn't be <laughs> <laughs> So we're encouraging them to be better atheists? <laughs> <laughs> not by this logic. Well, and Mariana, it's, it's worse yet. It's actually saying, um, not your bad guitar so you should stop. It's, hey, look at all these other people that are bad at guitar. Therefore, you shouldn't be a guitarist. Right? And it's like, wait. <laughs> wait a minute. Yeah, that's also true. Yeah, it's worse, so it's worse yet. Yeah. We just need to find the winning guitar formula, the winning way to write tabs. Okay, next one being that the Christian God is evil, and we can see this clearly in the Old Testament. Apparently, he is at the very least, incomplete list of what you might hear, misogynistic, genocidal, jealous, and he encourages slavery. This likely came from applying modern interpretations and understandings of words to biblical times. Some redefinitions going on here. So, I will be giving a general way to explain just the, I, the argument in general that God is evil, and then addressing each of those four in specific. So would anyone like to provide an argument, a defense for our beliefs that's either general or specific? I mean, I this is one of those things you have to take it more on a case-by-case basis, mm -hmm. right? Um, yes. Like, ask, well, why do you think he's misogynistic, for example? And then they'll show you some verse. And then you say, okay, like, are you understanding this verse correctly in its, you know, original context? Um, and then you just kind of have to do that with each one. There's no, like, real like, general answer that I can think of just kind of throw at it. That makes sense. Yeah, the general answer does kind of presuppose, in this case, that the person um, is Christian, or at least understands the Christian God. So I will say that it's not the best general example, but it might work. Oh, actually, hold on. Sure. Sorry, quick general answer. Um, what do you mean by evil? Right? Uh, like, well, by what, on what, uh, on what grounds are you calling anything evil, right? Like if you're denying that you know God exists, which presumably the same person knows, right? How is it that you call anything evil at all? Okay. So I guess that that's one way you can go with it. It's a more general approach. Yeah, Julian. You can also say which part of the Old Testament, and then ask them to read the context around it. Yeah, one, that helps. One that a lot of people will point towards is. Um, flood. Yeah. Like, how could God, you know, flood the earth and kill all these innocent people, but then you read the passages beforehand about how it says everybody on earth was exceedingly wicked. Like, well, yeah, there you go. Is that right there? Yeah. It'll help. <laughs> also, you might, um, kind of related to that, pointing out not just the Old Testament, but also the New Testament. Like, is it the same God in the Old Testament, New Testament, and he was evil, and then he redeemed himself? That seems confusing. 
All right, so to take a look at these, um, a general argument that you could possibly use is that, well, by God's very nature, he cannot be evil. Because God is holy, he just cannot be good and evil at the same time. He's not like a human who sometimes does good things and sometimes does evil things, but he is always good. So therefore, he can't be good in the New Testament and evil in the Old Testament. Um, you can also note how in Hebrew, Eve is called a helper. That word there, Eitzer, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. That's just a way I've heard it pronounced, so please don't blame me. Um, it doesn't just, <clears throat> doesn't just mean like a servant or a secretary or someone like that. It means a helper who is an equal in the relationship. Someone who, um, yeah, equal partner in everything that's being done. Um, I didn't research this fully beforehand, I'm just going off something my mom said, so we're going to assume that she has credibility here. <laughs> but um, in the really old, old, really old Hebrew that's more pictographical, the word for man is the word for stone and bow and arrow. The word for woman is stone, bow and arrow, and eye, like this kind of eye. So that's interesting that stone and bow and arrow are used in common, or whatever the two words are, if it's not that, it's something very close to that. That's not saying that women are better than men either. It's not saying, oh, all women are wiser or something than men are. It's just saying women and men have different roles, but in order for them to be whole, there does have to be men and women on this earth. So yes, we help each other. Uh, going to the genocidal idea. Note that the inhabitants of Canaan, or all the people in the world in the flood, or Sodom and Gomorrah, or a few different instances, they were evil for very many reasons, and not only that, but they were unrepentant. God had told them many times to repent, and none of them would. So God used people, again, using people, to enact his wrath. And don't forget from Julian's talk back earlier in October about the Nephilim, who um, were the Canaanites, Canaanites, or the Canaanites were descendants of them, who were this unholy mix of angels and humans that needed to be eradicated, for their evilness and so that they didn't lead other people into more evils, especially in Canaan for the Israelites. Um, like righteous anger, going to jealousy. Jealousy, I don't think, is always evil. If Sarah gave me this example earlier, if um, you see your husband slash wife slash boyfriend slash girlfriend hanging out with another person of the opposite gender, you're going to be jealous, hopefully. And, but it's going to be justified in this case because your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife is rightfully in a relationship with you. So God is jealous in the sense of loving us because we are rightfully his. So he doesn't like it when we're going off and following idols and other gods. Uh, going to slavery. Slavery had a very different meaning back then than what it means now. Back in um, ancient Israel times, it was more like servanthood, and there were a lot of rules about it that God wrote so that people, uh, Israelites would still be set apart from the other nations. So for example, you could not slave, enslave another Israelite. You could only enslave someone if they owed a debt to you. You had to set them free after a certain number of years. You had to, in many ways, treat them like another member of your household. It was not what we think of in um, early colonial America. So yes. God was not really encouraging slavery either. He was just more saying, if you have to have slaves, kind of like if you have to have a king, then here's how to do it in a way that's less evil. All right, two more left. Hopefully we can get through them fairly quickly so you can all go home. But um, <laughs> the idea that if God were real, he would prove it. Specifically, he would prove it to me. He would drop down out of the sky and prove to me that he is real. This likely came from just <coughs> stubborn dissatisfaction with other evidence or seeing how many miracles are recorded in the Bible, or misunderstanding Jesus' statement that God answers all our prayers if only we have faith. Again with the moving the mountain thing. So yeah, now moving in the floor. Julian. I'm not sure if you mentioned this on your slide, but um, a common argument that atheists will sometimes use against Christians, especially like in a high-level debate, is that they'll say, 
the evidence that we have from scripture of all these things happening, it was just a hallucination. Like it, when Jesus appeared to the um, to the disciples after the resurrection, it was just a, a hallucination by the group or whatever. But then those same people would also say that the proof that would make them a Christian would be some kind of appearance by God. Maybe he's coming down from the clouds and saying, go to church or whatever. It's like, well, why don't you think you would be having a hallucination in that situation to use your argument against you? Um, so if people want some kind of proof like that in the physical world, then they have to throw out the, uh, the rebuttal that they use against Christianity and maybe take that more seriously too. That's a really good point. Yep, and going just off the hallucination point in general, there was a time when Jesus appeared to like 500 people at once. Are we going to say they all hallucinated the same thing at the same time? Something. So there's that, and then there's also, um, you're kind of making a contradictory statement now. Right. How do you know you're not hallucinating? Oh. Okay, I'll go ahead and add these, I suppose. But um, yeah, the first thing you could ask is, how or why would you know that God would prove to you that he's real? God didn't really say in the Bible, oh, if you don't believe in me, just ask me and I'll come right down and show you. Uh, what evidence, here's a good question to ask people, that is, uh, what evidence would convince you that God is real? And unfortunately, a lot of times people can't really nail down an answer for this one, can't think of a specific piece of evidence that would be the final convincement, made up word, that God is real. Although some people will say the idea of God coming down in the clouds and telling them to go to church, something like that, or, hey, Bob, I'm God. <laughs> but yeah, this is where faith and the free choice to love the Lord come in, that out of his love he's not trying to force us to believe in him. Um, because if he did come down and try to convince us he's real, then we might think, oh, well, I don't need Jesus, I just believe now, but I'm not going to put a lot of stock in my belief or relationship, which is not good. Um, there's also the fact that even if God doesn't do miracles anymore, which there is a lot of debate on that, does he or does he not anymore, um, that doesn't mean that he never did miracles, that he never was proving that he was real to people in those days and those ages. Because in the Bible, whenever a miracle was done, it had a very specific purpose, which was to verify that this person was sent by God. In Jesus' case, that he was the son of God, and he is who he says he is. We, nobody just does a miracle to do something cool, to like show off for their friends. That would be a misuse of God's power. So that's why if you're saying like, oh, move this mountain just because I want to see the mountain move for fun, for entertainment, it's not going to work out. You can also ask the person, uh, how chaotic and contradictory would it be if everyone's wishes were always granted all the time. I'm praying for NC State to win, Chapel Hill's playing for Chapel Hill to win. They can't both win. Unless we have a tie and then nobody's happy anyway. And it wouldn't be very loving of God if he spoiled us and was constantly answering all of our prayers in this way. He hears all our prayers, but he only carries out his ultimate perfect plans. Because from an eternal perspective, you'll always get something better than you asked for. And for the final misconception, uh, Christians are intrusive to other people's lives. Or you might hear it said as Christians are told to force their beliefs onto other people. Like it came from some Christians, unfortunately, yes, being pushy. Or a desperation or fear that a person won't, this person here won't be saved if I don't say something to them right now. So how might you respond if someone told you, oh, you're just being pushy on me, stop intruding on my life? in a very pushy way mm -hmm. and they'll be like oh if you don't turn your life to God I mean you're going to hell and like all these things I mean it, it just comes down to the way that you approach people and um, ultimately changing the way that you do approach people to make it the best way I mean and that comes from reading the Bible and you know actually applying scripture to the way that you spread the gospel and stuff like that because I mean we're not told to just condemn people and ultimately we can't do that yeah we're just as deserving of that too going back actually to Romans 8 1 I forgot to mention that that's referring to eternal condemnation by the way but yeah going back to your point um, yeah it really depends because if you're 
are being pushy or forceful, you're just going to unfortunately turn the person away from Christianity to even more that they don't want to believe. So yes, extremely important there. Uh, Austin and then Julie. I asked for a little bit of grace to maybe you know, point out that if you grant me that I believe what I believe, that it, I think it's true at the very least, then I believe your eternal salvation or state is in, um, is in peril. So it would be immoral of me to not try to express my beliefs. At least, you know, not in a pushy way, right, but at least to share it. So I'd ask for a little bit of grace and be like, hey, like, if you grant me that, at least, you know, I'm not trying to be mean, just I do believe that is an issue. That's a great point. Yeah, it's speaking the truth in love. You gotta have the truth, you gotta have love. Yep. Then Julia. Um, someone may say, don't force your beliefs on me, but in saying that, they are forcing some kind of belief on you. That's true. They're doing yeah. exactly what they're asking you not to do. Yep, use the roadrunner tactic there, as we say, and I don't have enough faith that, um, aren't you just forcing your beliefs on me? Yep, pretty effective. Okay, if there's no more final thoughts, I'll go ahead and pop up these. Um, yeah, if you knew how to help save a life, why wouldn't you act on that knowledge? Going to Austin's point that this is a very big deal, and we know that it is, so we're not trying to be mean, we're doing this out of a place of love for you. And I think sometimes we just have to be careful about communicating that point. Sorry, I forgot exactly the explanation you were giving earlier, but it was a really good one that, um, we were talking before, but um, I can uh, share it. if you want to share it again, yeah. that'd be great, please. Um, so imagine like if you're if you see this bridge and it's broken halfway in the middle, and there's cars driving on the bridge, and they don't know it's broken, but you know it's broken, it would be wrong to not tell them because you're just like letting them die. You know they're going off a broken bridge, you're letting them die, and so like you not telling them is like morally wrong. It's not okay. And same with us, like if we know that people have sinned against God and they're under his judgment and they're going to be condemned if we don't say something or if God doesn't save them, then it's wrong for us to not at least like tell them about God. Yeah, so again with the saving the life aspect there. Yep, very important. And also just note to kind of Christians as ourselves, remember that God is not relying on us. He could come and... He's probably not going to actually come and force someone to be Christian because, again, not very loving of them. But he can always use another person. He can always use another method. Sometimes Jesus does appear to people in dreams and things like that. The way my family likes to put it is that we as Christians are in sales and God is in management. We can never actually bring a person to God. The person has to decide for themselves, I want to believe in God. I'm going to put my trust into him. And we can't do that for anyone. And if God really wants someone to go to heaven, I don't want to get too much into Calvinism or Buddhism right now, but God will always make sure that there is a way for a person to believe. If that's important. Alright, so then um, because I'm a business major and you know I'm preparing for the business <laughs> world, or we can just kind of take information from wherever and you just have to trust me on it, I, I don't have to cite my sources. So good night. <laughs> no, here we go. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.